Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May the 7th. And um, what we're going to do today is to start off with taking up the uh, homework question that you should have uh, handed in for last week, which is question 112 in your question bank. So I'm going to take that up to begin with. And then after that, um, we're going to continue with the review of the material. Last week, we did chapters 1, 2, and 9. So today we're gonna to carry on with chapters three to eight. We're gonna stop uh, periodically to do some questions. We're gonna definitely do a question on audit risk because you know that when you write your AA paper in September, there's gonna be a question on audit risk. We'll stop after we look on, at chapter four on internal controls because again, we know there's gonna be a question on internal controls. And then after we cover off the chapters five and six, we'll do a question on substantive procedures because again, we know you're gonna get questions on substantive audit procedures. And then after we finish chapter eight or seven and eight, then we'll do a question on going concern and the audit report. Okay, so again, today is finishing off the review of the material, doing some questions. And then next week, which is our last um, class um, for, um, your mock exam, which I understand will be in August, and then we'll have a revision mock right after that. Um, but next week, you're going to do an AA exam from 9 to 12.15. So when you log in at 9 o'clock or just before that, at 9 o'clock, I'll tell you which AA past exam paper you're going to do. And then in the afternoon, we'll, we'll take up the answers, and then um, I'll, uh, I'll do a few other things. And then, um, yeah, you should be... Good to go, but good to go, meaning that we've gone through all the material and you'll know what areas you need to focus in on as you get closer to September. Okay, so any questions before I start? Again, you can talk to me or you can always put questions in the chat if that's what you prefer. No, sir, not so far. Okay, so let's start. Let's again take a look at question 112 in your question bank. Um, it starts off by asking you to compare the responsibility of the, of the um, directors and the auditors regarding the published financial statements when it comes to um, limited companies. So it's interesting because these questions keep coming up, 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 keep asking, they keep asking them again. Now, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you weren't asked to do this question, so I'm going to, that part, so I'm going to leave it. And the reason I didn't ask you to do it, because it's the same story, right? Management's responsible for making sure that companies are going concern. Management is responsible for ensuring, and the directors, that's the same, for ensuring that the company's not a going concern, they have to disclose it. The auditor's responsibilities is to assess whether the company is going to continue for the next year. If they're not going to be able to continue, they're going to require no disclosure. And if they refuse to no disclose, then we're going to issue a qualified or adverse report. Okay, so let's focus on the parts that you were required to do, which is part B, asking for the different stages when analytic review procedures are to be done by the auditor. So again, analytic procedures are looking at this year's numbers compared to last year's, looking at this year's numbers compared to the budget. Analytic review procedures are done at three, at three different stages at the planning stage, and it's done to identify any possible uh, material misstatements. So the reason why, again, you look at this year's revenues compared to last year's when they first give you the initial numbers to see if there's any, high, if there's any areas that are high risk of material misstatement. So if this year's revenues went up, went up by 20% compared to last year's revenues, it could be an indication that they're overstating this year's revenues, which is, highly likely because they have an incentive because they usually get bonuses based on the bottom line. So you have to make sure there's no cutoff errors, which means they didn't take revenues in the new year and put into the old year. You wanna make sure the revenues are accurate. You wanna make sure that they don't have any fictitious revenues. Also, it should be done as part of the review stage because ultimately we have to give an opinion on the financial statements. And when we give our opinion on the financial statements, we know we have to audit the final numbers. If we don't get any assurance from testing the controls, we're gonna get all our testing from a combination of test of detail of balance and analytic review. That's known as substantive procedures. So we can look at this year's revenues compared to last year's if we've tested the internal controls to provide some assurance that those numbers are fine. 
which is part of the during part of the review engagement. We're also supposed to do it at the final stage because the numbers can change as your as they initial give as they give you the initial draft financial statements and you do your analytic review on the numbers. Those numbers can change because either we have errors that they agree to adjust or they come up with errors or adjustments that they want to make. Therefore, the numbers can change. That's why we have to do analytic review again at the final stage to identify whether it's any possible misstatement. As far as indicators that this company potentially could be a going concern and you need to, in part C, you need to not only identify the indicators, but you need to explain. Because they tell you to explain the potential indicators that strawberry is not a going concern. Okay, so again, not means the company will not be able to continue. We presume when we're auditing a company that the companies are a going concern, which means they will continue for the next year. But if they're not a going concern, it means they're not going to be able to continue. The key word is explain. So first of all, they're losing a major customer who owes them 0.6 million with an unlikely chance of recovering it. As a result, if they're not going to recover the 0.6 million, then obviously it, that's going to impact their cash flow. But also, if it's a major customer, it's going to affect future cash. It's going to affect future cash sales. It's going to affect future cash flow. And if companies don't have cash flow, they're not going to continue in business. So that's one of them you could have mentioned. Another one is that they have a cash position that is worsened over the two periods with a positive balance of 1.2 million and an overdraft of 0.8 million. The loan balance has also significantly increased from 0.2 million to 4.8. So when companies have loans that are increasing and they don't have the funds, how are they gonna pay their interest? Another example, the company may not be able to continue. When it comes to payment to suppliers, they mentioned that the client is struggling to pay its suppliers when the amounts owed are due with some suppliers already threatening legal action. So once again, if they're unable to pay off their suppliers, the suppliers are going to cut them off, which means they're not going to be able to buy their items they need. Once again, if they don't have the items, they're not going to be able to continue in business. Another indication that this is a going concern problem. Loan repayment. The bank is re requesting a full repayment of the long-term debt within six months, yet they don't seem to have the funds to be able to pay them. Where are they going to get the funds from? They don't have the funds. They're going to go under. Once again, they're not going to be able to continue in operations. Also, you can mention that when it comes to the dividend withdrawal, the directors have decided not to pay final dividends to equity shareholders. A couple of things this can trigger. This may upset them, which could lead them to selling their shares or better still not putting any more equity in the company when the company needs money. If they can't get more funds or people start getting out, they're not going to have the money to continue in business. Also, you can mention that the sales director has recently left the company and they've not been replaced. If a key employee has left the company, has not been replaced, that clearly is another indication of a going concern because they may not be able to continue without that person who needs to be there. The operations are, are not going to be run efficiently or ineffectively. Okay, so that's the answer to that part. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Okay, so part D, assets for going concern, audit procedures. So again, when the, you as an auditor I believe that the company may not be able to continue and there's indicators you need to follow up to see what they're doing about it. So for example, we should ask senior management how they plan to deal with the bank's demand on the whole loan repayment. We say to the management, how are you going to repay back the bank? Oh, well, we're going to check with another bank. Fine. Have you checked with another bank? Yes. Are they going to give you the funds? Yes, they will. Then guess what you're going to do? You're going to follow up with that bank and get something in writing that they're going to provide them with the funds. Because if they don't provide them with the funds, then they're not going to be able to pay back the bank, and therefore they will go out of business. But you don't take their word for it, right? Because inquiry is the least reliable evidence. But we'll ask them initially, and maybe they will say to us, well, we have no idea. Then you're going to say to them, fine, I need a note that you're not going to be, you may not be able to continue in business. Review post year end sales and cash flow to assess whether things are improving or maybe they're getting worse. So again, you're in there after the year end, 
You're worried about the fact they may not be able to continue. Well, guess what? They're still running their business. Has sales improved? Has the cash flow improved? Get them to provide a cash flow statement of how things are going to look in six months. Then assess the cash flow statement to see if it's accurate, if it makes sense. Look at the board minutes to ascertain whether the board has made any comments to the fact that the company may not be able to continue. And if so, what are they doing about it? Ask the company lawyers to determine whether there's any lawsuits against the company. Remember the suppliers were threatening to, put, put, to sue them? Check with the lawyers. Have this actually happened? If so, what are the claims? What's the amounts that are involved? Will they have the funds to pay this out if they lose? Okay, so again, ultimately you have a responsibility that if the company doesn't have any note disclosure in the notes, the financial statements, it is presumed that they'll be able to continue for the next year. You have responsibility, if you see any indicators that they may not be able to continue, to follow it up through audit procedures to assess whether or not they will be able to continue or not. Okay, any questions on this particular question? Number 112 in the question bank. No, sir. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to take you through chapter three, a very important chapter on risk assessment. And then after I complete this chapter, then we'll work on a question because we know this is one topic that will be guaranteed to be on your paper. Okay, so again, after about every six or seven slides, I will stop to see if there's any questions. Again, I've got to go through this a lot faster than the first time around. Otherwise, all we're going to do today is, is, is go over the material and not practice questions. Okay, so again, this is a review, right? A reminder of what we've covered off from before. Okay, so this is to remind you that what's the objective of an audit? To provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, whether the statements are fairly presented, which means no significant errors, whether due to error or fraud, and the we have to provide an opinion as to whether or not those numbers are fairly presented in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework, which we know is IFRS for public companies and for private companies, accounting status for private enterprises. But we're also required to not only give an opinion on the financials, but to communicate as required by the standard. So in addition to giving an opinion, what else do we need to do? We need to also issue a management letter on inter internal control weaknesses and implication. So at the end of the day, we're always worried about doing a good audit because if we don't, we're going to get sued. So we've got to have good, strong, quality control environment, which means we've got to make sure that we do a proper audit. So as a result, these are some of the things that, that CPA firms do to ensure they have good audits. They basically have a second partner involved. They make sure that when they hire people, they're very careful, making sure they don't have a, a criminal record before they hire them, when they do the work, review the staff's work, give them an appraisal so they can improve in the future. When the audit is complete, have, have, do a cold review means, well, so not a cold review. When you're finished, you'll do a hot review. But these quality control that they're talking about here as it is at the overall level of the firm, which means this is what they do in general. So in general, they were periodically review files to make sure that they complied with the standards. That's called a cold review. Again, when it comes to hiring people in general, make sure that you hire good people, make sure that you have a partner that's going to review as a second partner on every audit to make sure that the standards were complied with. But then we have specific quality control me measures on every assignment. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about reviews, you'll do a hot review which means when the file is over, person on every audit that is done will check to make sure the standards are completed. A cold review means you look at it years later. You also make sure that on each audit that people, the assistants are properly supervised, provided with direction, and someone reviews the work. Make sure that the work is properly documented in the working papers that you, that you complied with all the standards. Okay, so ISA 300, International Standards of Auditing, covers off the fact that on every audit, you gotta properly plan for the engagement. You gotta, and why? Because if you don't plan for the engagement, then, then you won't do an audit efficiently and effectively. You won't, if you don't plan, you're not gonna know what the risks are. If you don't know what the risks are, then you won't spend potentially enough effort in areas that require, require attention because there could be errors. 
You need to plan so you know exactly the work involved, so you know what staff to put on. You need to also plan in case there's other auditors that are involved, whether they is a subsidiary and there's other auditors. It's a consolidation and there's subsidiaries and the sub subsidiary companies are audited by another accounting firm. You need to be aware of it because you're going to have to rely on another auditor or there's internal auditors involved and they're going to do work for you. You need to coordinate your efforts. Again, there's a detailed, there's an audit strategy that needs to be done on every audit. Again, you can see a number of things that need to be included in a general audit strategy. But there's also things that you need to know about when you're doing a detailed audit plan. Okay, so there's things that have to be done when you're doing a, when you're doing an audit strategy in general, including the objectives of the engagement. This is very general, including factors that in the auditor's professional judgment are significant in directing the engagement, meaning that you do some initial assessment of materiality, initial identification of risk, but then you need a detailed audit plan for, for that particular engagement, which includes more specific materiality, which includes more specific work on that particular audit client, including analytic review procedures, which includes your specific testing, when you're gonna do the work, you're gonna have budgets for each area. So a detailed audit plan is obviously a lot more detailed, about how you're going to approach, how you're going to do the audit. The, obviously, the audit strategy is more general. Okay, another thing that you have to worry about is the need to follow ISA 315, how you need to understand the company, the environment, the, the industry. Why? Because you're going to have to do a detailed risk assessment. Remember, we don't get the same amount of audit evidence on every client. What's going to trigger you to get more audit evidence? Risks. And that's why you're going to get questions on, on having to determine how risks impact a company's financial statements. Because certain areas are going to have a higher risk of being materially misstated. As a result, the auditor is going to have to respond to those risks. ISA 315 talks about the need to understand the entity, the environment, the internal controls to understand the risks that could be increased, that could be impact in the financial statements. ISA 330 talks about the auditor's response to those risks. So it's not good enough just to do a risk assessment. The question is, how are you gonna to respond to that risk? That's why these questions ask you to explain the risk and your response. Your response is ISA 330. How are you gonna deal with that risk? Okay, so we always know that there's always a possibility that we could end up issuing the wrong opinion. That's always the case. You cannot avoid it because we know we do sampling. We don't look at 100% of the transactions. We know that there's judgment involved in looking at the receivables, the inventory, there's estimates. There's always a risk that management can get it wrong and we can also get it wrong. The evidence we get is persuasive, not conclusive, meaning that there are certain evidence such as confirmation, recalculation, reperformance is highly reliable, but it's not conclusive. When we get a confirmation from a third, from a, a customer confirming how much they owe the company that we're auditing, yes, it's highly reliable, but they may have signed off the confirmation without looking. They may be in collusion with the company we're auditing and saying that the receivable is correct. Again, evidence is persuasive, not conclusive. There's a lot of estimates in the receivables, in the inventory for obsolescence, for the allowance of Delta accounts, there's always a possibility that management got it wrong, and guess what, we got it wrong as well. If management is up to no good, there's a good chance we're not gonna find it. That's why we always worry about management's integrity. We don't wanna get involved with companies that could be up to no good, but ultimately, you never know for sure. Okay, so a good risk assessment will decide whether again, how much evidence we have to get because we want to minimize that risk of us issuing the wrong opinion. Okay, there's a number of ways for us to determine what the risks are. We can ask management questions. We can do our analytic review. Remember, we just talked about it. Why you do analytic review at the planning stage? To identify possible risks of material misstatement. Why did revenues go up by 20%? Normally revenues should not go up very much. In this day and age with COVID-19, I expect revenues to be dropping. Okay, so again, we need to know the definition of audit risk is a risk that we can end up issuing the wrong opinion. And what's gonna guide us in doing our risk assessment is this audit risk model. 
AR is the risk of us issuing the wrong opinion. How much risk do we want to take? The inherent risk is the likelihood of there being a material misstatement. Before we consider the controls, the control risk is the likelihood the company has good controls and they're working. And then we, the detection risk falls out. So the audit will set the audit risk. They assess the inherent risk. They assess the control risk. Detection risk falls out. And that will determine how much evidence we have to obtain. So when it comes to inherent risk, the likelihood of there being a material misstatement, obviously companies that get bonuses based on the bottom line, that's going to increase the inherent risk of them going to increase revenues, understate expenses to increase net income. Obviously, if companies are having going concern issues, they're going to do whatever they can to overstate revenues, understate expenses to make the company look good. If there's estimates involved, that increases the inherent risk because they're very subjective. The control risk is the controls that are in place to whether or not, and controls are important because they reduce the chances of errors. So we're going to assess the controls. Again, the next chapter four, we'll talk about specific controls. But ultimately, when we assess the inherent and control risk, then we're in a position to determine what the detection risk is. For example, if the audit risk is low, why would it be low? Because the audit does not want to take on a lot of chances that they could end up issuing the wrong opinion. The inherent risk was high. Why? Because management has bonuses based on the bottom line. There's a lot of estimates. The controls are not good, so the control risk is high. Therefore, detection risk is gonna be low. Low equals high times high. Detection risk has to be low in that formula. In order to keep detection risk low, the auditor has to get a lot of evidence. How do they get the evidence? If control risk was high, it means they can't get any evidence from relying on the controls they get all their evidence for some substantive procedures. They will do a lot of testing, they'll have more experienced staff, as opposed to when the detection risk is high because inherent and control risk were both low. In that case, when detection risk was high, then the auditor doesn't have to get as much evidence. They get the evidence mainly from testing the controls. Control risk was low. As a result, we will do primarily analytic procedures. Okay, so again, what I just did was using this audit risk model, in order to determine your detection risk, that will then determine how much evidence you have to get, not to mention your approach. So again, we will assess the financial statement risk. The financial statement risk is a combination of the inherent risk and the control risk. Again, when the inherent risk and the control risk are high, then the detection risk is low, which means that we have to get a lot of audit evidence by looking at a number, getting large samples, more experienced staff, and, and mainly substantive procedures. So again, ISA 315 talks about how the auditor has to do a risk assessment. This is now talking about how we respond to those risks. There are two types of frauds that can take place. There's fraudulent financial reporting that normally is done by senior management who want to manipulate the financial statements and numbers because they get bonuses based on the bottom line. Then there's misappropriation of assets are normally done by employees. The employees steal the assets, management is concerned about their bonuses. When it comes to auditor's responsibility for fraud, we are not there to look for fraud, but we're there to identify the likelihood of fraud taking place. We do what's called a fraud risk assessment. So this is another area that you need to be aware of, ISA 240, because you just never know what they're gonna ask other than audit risk, substantive procedures, internal control weakness and implication and recommendations. The, the ultimate responsibility to making sure there's no fraud is management's responsibility and the board slash audit committee that is charged with governance, with oversee management, will hopefully ensure that there's no fraud. Our objective is to provide an opinion that there's no material misstatements or due to either error or fraud. As a result, we have to always do an audit with professional skepticism. Professional skepticism means a questioning mind. We need to have a discussion amongst the audit team whether we believe fraud's taking place. We need to ultimately look at the fraud risk factors and determine what's the likelihood of fraud taking place. Again, these are the standards that need to be met. You have to make sure you're aware of these standards because if you're not, not only could you not, not only could you be tested on them and you not know the answers, but this is what a CPA firm needs to do when they do an audit. If we decide there's a good chance there's fraud taking place and how, what are the fraud risk factors? Incentive, opportunity, and rationalization. 
The receiver management gets bonuses based on the bottom line. We see that they have lousy controls. We're going to conclude that the chances of fraud taking place are high. How do you respond to that? Well, you're going to, once again, when there's a high risk area, you're going to assign more experienced staff. You're going to do more testing. You're going to do things on an unpredictable basis. Once again, you need to be aware of what you would do if you believe there's a good chance there's fraud taking place. If you do discover this fraud taking place, you have a responsibility to inform management. If management is involved in fraud, you're definitely going to the audit committee and the board to inform them of it. Obviously, there, if there's major fraud taking place by management or even the board, you're going to consider going to the regulatory body. Even though confidentiality needs to be met, maybe it is so serious, you can, you can consult with a legal lawyer, a lawyer who will advise you, don't worry about confidentiality, you need to inform the regulatory bodies. So who's responsible for making sure that the company complies with laws and regulations? The answer is the company. But we have responsibility because if the companies do not comply with laws and regulations, they'll be subject to fines and penalties. As a result, if there's any breaches, we need to bring it to management, to the audit committee's attention. We maybe need to seek legal advice to determine what is the impact. Because at the end of the day, if they violate laws and regulations, what could happen? They could be subject to fines and penalties that either need to be disclosed in the notes of financial statements or accrued, known as contingent liabilities. So again, remember, you are auditing the financial statements. You have to make sure there's no material misstatements. You have to make sure that they're recording the items in accordance to the accounting standards. So in the case of them violating a law and regulation, that could result in a contingent liability but you're not gonna know if there are any contingent liabilities, if they broke any laws and regulations, if you're not aware of the laws and regulations. So that's why as an auditor, we need to be aware of the laws and regulations and we need to look for instances that they may have violated them. In the question that we just take, took up, we talked about analytic review procedures, basically looking at this year's numbers compared to last year's. This is one of the types of audit evidence. We saw that it is done at three different stages. Again, that was the question we just did at the planning. As part of the review, getting evidence as substantive procedures and at the final stage, a final check. You need to know these six ratios because you never know that there's two ways they can do audit risk assessment. One is they can give you some information and ask you to identify the risks and how it impacts the financial statements and your response, or they can give you financial statements. And you need to do these ratios because these could all be indicators there's risk of material misstatement. So memorize the gross margin profit because if your gross margin profit changes from one year to the next, we don't expect it to. The reason why it did change was there could be a risk that the accounts are materially misstated, the sales or the, or the cost of goods sold. Return on capital is important because when a company's return on capital gets worse and worse and worse, it could be an indication that the companies are going concerned. Stock days, you need to memorize again that formula because if the items remain on hand longer and longer, it could be an indication that they are not going to be able to collect what they're, pay, they're not going to be able to sell it at what they recorded at and therefore needs to be written down. It's an indication of valuation could be an issue when it comes to inventory. Similarly, if the receivable days, if the receivables are staying longer and longer around after an item is sold, the receivable turnover is getting worse. Once again, it could be an indication that the receivables will not be collectible, which means that they need to set up a provision. We worry about the valuation assertion. And if the creditor days, it's taking them longer and longer to pay off their creditors. Once again, this could be an indication that either the losing discounts, but more importantly, that the fact that they could be going under. And the gearing, debt versus equity. Compare it this year to last year. If the debt to equity is getting worse, that's not good. Once again, that can be an indication of growing concern. So let me pause and see if there's any questions so far about risk assessment. Any questions? Again, you can speak to me or you can put it in the chat if there's any questions. Okay, so otherwise, we're now gonna talk about another important area, materiality. Materiality is important because remember, when you finish a job, you got to, when you finish the audit, you got to add up all your errors and see if those errors are significant, where you have to ask management to make an adjustment. 
or if they're below materiality, all your errors, then you're gonna give them a clean, unqualified report. Or if they are material and they refuse to record them, then is it material or is it so material? We need to know materiality. Materiality is that amount that will impact a user's decision. The auditor has to determine what materiality is by considering the users and which basis would be relevant. Is it revenues? Is it total assets? Or is it profit before tax? Again, this is something that you have to memorize. The half to 1% of revenues as a guideline, one to 2% of total assets, and five to 10% of profit before tax. What you do is you consider the users, which basis would be relevant to them. You decide where you go in the range, depending on risk. If it's a riskier audit, you wanna go with a lower percentage because it could be errors that will result in a lower materiality, which means a less of a threshold for errors. But this is the overall materiality that we're talking about, adding up all the errors and comparing it to overall materiality at the end of an audit. But how do we decide how much work we do when we look at individual accounts? We don't consider overall materiality. We consider performance materiality. Performance materiality is, is because needed because there's always a risk that there could be more errors in the total population than we believe there could be. Remember, when you do an audit, you look at a sample. Based on a sample, you'll find there's errors. You'll then extrapolate it over the remaining population. There's always a risk there could be more errors in the total population than in the errors in the sample plus the extrapolation. To take that into account, what we do is we come up with performance materiality, which is anywhere between 50 and 90% of your planning materiality. Again, if you're worried, you're gonna go with a lower performance materiality, that's gonna result in you looking at more accounts. If you're not as worried, you go with a higher percentage, but you can't use planning because there's always a risk there could be more errors than you expected. So we should ask management to correct all, to correct all identified misstatements because at the end of the day, errors that are immaterial, one day could become material. And obviously if they're definitely material, they need to be adjusted because if they don't, it's gonna impact our opinion. The final topic, in this chapter three is based on the working papers. The working papers are clearly important because first of all, the working papers will demonstrate to the courts that you did a quality audit, you complied with the standards. It also helps the engagement team plan for the audit, which means by having last year's working papers, we can plan for this year's audit. It helps us demonstrate and not to demonstrate, but how can a supervisor review the work if there's no working papers? It holds staff accountable. It allows for reviews of the working papers. And more importantly, how does, an issue, how does a partner decide if the company complied with the standards if there are no working papers, meaning that it's part of the quality control reviews and inspection done. Remember, there's hot reviews and cold reviews of what? The working papers. So there better be good working papers. What are some of the attributes of good working papers? Well, each working paper should indicate the year end. It should indicate who prepared the working paper, the date, what's the objective of the work, what were the results, what were the conclusions, who reviewed the work, and the date that it was reviewed. Each working paper should contain those qualities. There's typically two files that are done in every audit. There's a file that supports this year's audit. Okay, that's called the current file. And then there's gonna, which include what's in the current file. You have things like the audit program, you have your risk assessment, you have your calculation materiality, you have your working papers that supports the work done on the audit procedures that are part of the audit program. You will also make notes in there, points for next year's audit, which when you do the next year's audit, you'll get last year's working papers. But then there's also things that go into the permanent file. Permanent file are things of a permanent nature that the auditor will need to take a look at every time they do an audit for this year. So for this year, we'll, take, we'll, we'll create a file for this year's audit. We'll have last year's audit file to help us if there's any points carried forward. But anything of a permanent nature, like system flow charts, the organization chart that we're going to have to refer to, the engagement letter, which will be updated every year, all goes into the permanent file. Okay, so at this point, let me ask you if, again, there's any questions on chapter four. Make that chapter three on planning and your risk assessment. No, everybody's good? 
Okay, so I think at this point, what we need to do is to practice a question. So can you please take a look at September, December of 2017, September, December of 2017, and we will do question 17. Okay, so again, we're going to do September, December, Oops, just trying to put in what we're doing. September slash December 2017, past exam. Question 17. U17. Okay. So find that question. There are three parts to that question. Do you remember I told you that audit risk is going to be on? Well, it's on this, right? That's part C. Use all the information provided. Describe seven audit risks and explain the audit response to each risk. Remember, when you talk about the risk related to the financial statements, and then what clearly is your response? So that would be the two columns, right? The first column, you should have explain the risk or identify, well, it says using all information, describe. Describe, describe means to not only identify, but to explain. And then the second column, so the first column is describe the risk, the second column is explain it, right? When you do your actual AA paper, they will have the two columns ready for you to go. But these are old questions at that point, you have to create the format. But we should also think about part A and B, because this is what they're gonna do. Not only gonna give you audit risk, they're gonna ask you other questions that relate to planning. So again, the, the guaranteed question is part C, but then we have this big bucket. This is why in the big bucket, they're gonna ask you different questions from other parts of the paper that you're responsible for. Okay, so you've got part A, B, and C. Okay, I'm gonna give you about uh, 35 minutes to work on this, so which means I'm going to give you until 10.15, and then at that point, I will be back to take up this answer. Okay, so work on that. And what I'm gonna do now is to pause the recording while you're working on the, on this question. All right, so now we're taking up September, December, 2017, Q17. Okay, so part A asks us to, what are some of the things you should consider before taking on this audit? What are preconditions for an audit when accepting the audit of Prancer? Okay, so I'm gonna give you three answers, but of course there's others. So at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that management will assume responsibility for the following. They're gonna assume responsibility for the preparation of financial statements in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. Again, if it's a private company, it'd be ASPE. If it's a public company, it'd be IFRS. If the company says, quote, we will not take responsibility for the financial statements, that's why we're hiring you as an auditor to tell us if everything's okay, you don't take on the audit. You need to make sure that they take responsibility for internal controls. Remember, management has responsibility for internal controls. Again, if they say to us, no, 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 we, we are counting on you to tell us whether or not we have good controls. Not good. And they're also going to Take they understand it's their responsibility to provide access, full access to us, meaning that when we do our audit, they cannot prevent us from looking at something. Now, of course, after we take, take on the audit, if they don't allow us to do something, it's gonna be a scope limitation. But you don't take on an audit knowing ahead of time that they will not be giving you full access. Okay, so those are three things that you can mention. Of course, there's other things that you can mention. Not, they're not the only three, but those are the three that are highlighted in the solution, so that's why I'm making reference to them as well. Okay, so again, at any time, if there's any questions, clarification, use the chat, speak up. Okay, Part B asks us about the audit strategy. Where three main areas, other than audit risk, which should be included in the audit strategy. So again, if you look back at the notes, they talk about 
different things that you can consider, and they want you also to provide an example that's relevant to this to the audit. So one of the things that you can consider is the characteristics of the engagement, whether or not the, for example, whether or not the financial information is to be prepared in accordance with which relevant financial reporting framework. So again, part of your strategy is to figure out do they have to follow IFRS, do they have to follow ASPE. Also, the availability of key personnel at the company, Prancer Construction Company. Then there's the reporting objectives, timing, and nature of the communication. Reporting objectives, timing, and nature of communication. So we need some timelines as to when the audit's gonna take place, when are we gonna be in there working during the year and after the year end, what are some timelines? We need an organization of meetings with the company to discuss any audit issues arising. So we're going to have to set up also meetings with the client during the year because of any issues that come up. Another consideration is preliminary engagement activities and knowledge from the previous engagements. So what we need to do is take a look at the results of our work in the previous years on internal controls, any evidence of management's commitment to design implementation of such controls, because we need to have that information to decide whether or not we're going to rely and test those controls. Also the nature, timing and extent of resources, which basically means that we need to decide which audit team to be put on, which number of staff, the experience of the staff, also setting an audit budget, meaning each person that's put on the audit, we have to tell them how long they have to do their section. So again, this type of question is just, again, this is the big bucket that I always refer to that they may ask you questions from. That's why if you look at my review questions for chapter three, you're going to have a question there, which we saw on the slides. What are the, what are various, areas that you should be consider that you should consider when doing your audit strategy. Okay, part C is the one that we take to the bank, right? They're gonna ask us somewhere on the paper for 10 to 15 marks, what are audit risks, explain them, and then what's your response? Okay, so this question asks you for seven, and we're going to identify at least seven, maybe eight or nine. First of all, they told us very early in this question that this is a new audit client for Cupid and company. That is clearly a risk. Because it's a new client, we may not be finished familiar with the accounting policies. We may not be familiar with the transactions. What does that do? Increases the risk that could be material misstatements in the financials. So again, not just say that this is a first year audit, so why does that increase the risk? Because we've never done the audit before, we're not familiar with the accounting, the accounting policies, we're not familiar with the transactions. As a result, increases the risk that could be material misstatements. So as a result, what, how are we gonna respond to it? Are you gonna put staff on it that are inexperienced or experienced? No, no, you need stronger staff. You also should ensure that because you've never done the audit before, you do a detailed you make sure you understand the company fully because you don't have information from the past, even though if you did, you'd still need to understand the company. But because you've never done this before, you need to have full understanding of the company so you can identify the risks. They told you in the paragraph under meeting notes that the prior year financial statements recognize work in progress of 1.8 million, which was comprised of property construction in progress as well as ongoing maintenance. So the bottom line is they have a large amount of work in progress at year end. What's the risk? The risk is that if it is work in progress, they're gonna to have to decide what percentage of it is complete. That's how you do work in progress. Is it 40%, 90%? So if they have a large amount that's work in progress, what's the risk? The risk is they're gonna say that it's 50% complete when it's only 20%. They're gonna get it incorrect. We're worried about the valuation of the inventory. It could be under or overstated because they have to apply a certain percentage to determine the work in progress, which you can see is a large amount, 1.8 million. What's our response? We should discuss with management how they determine the percentage of completion. We should review when we're attending the inventory to see what percentage they determine things to be complete and we should audit it to see if it's done correctly. On the other hand, if you think you need an expert to determine whether or not something is 50% complete or 80%, that could be another response. Hire a specialist to help you determine the percentage of something is completed. That could be your response to that risk. 
They told you in that paragraph I just read that the August 2007 management accounts recognized 2.1 million of inventory completed properties compri to compri compared to a balance of 1.4 million. Meaning that our inventory is now a lot higher than the previous year. Last year was 1.4, now it's 2.1. Is that a large increase? Yes, it is. If it's a large increase in inventory, is the reason for that is because they're not gonna get what they paid for it, meaning that they may be struggling to sell completed properties. Therefore, as a result of valuation, when it comes to the properties, they may be recorded at a higher amount than the selling price. We need to do a detailed cost and net realizable value testing to be done at year end to ensure that the items in inventory don't need to be written down. Again, because the inventory is quite a bit higher than last year, maybe it is because no one's buying it, they're not getting the price. As a result, the cost could be higher than the price. That's why it needs to be written down. They told you at the end of that paragraph on meeting notes, a full, inventory, full year inventory count will be undertaken at September 30th at all of the 11 building sites where construction is in progress, but there's not enough audit team resources to attend all inventory counts. So first of all, we don't have to attend all the inventory counts. We know that, but we need to do a sample. Therefore, there's a risk. If they have 11 properties and we don't attend enough of them, including the major ones where there's major inventory, there's a risk that inventory could be under or overstated. What's our response? We should attend those inventory counts that are large, that are material, and maybe a few others at random. So again, when there's 11 properties, when there's a lot of properties, or if you're doing an inventory count of anybody that has many warehouses, you can't attend them all. But what's the risk? The risk is we don't attend enough major ones. We may end up saying that everything's okay when it wasn't okay. What's another risk? They told you that in the second paragraph that it offers their customers a five-year building warranty. As soon as I think of a warranty, what do I think of? A provision. What's the problem with a provision? It's a risk. It's an estimate. When they set up a provision for warranty, it's possible they could under or overstate their provision because it's subject to an estimate. It's a risk of material misstatement. What do you need to do as, as an auditor? You need to discuss with management how they came up with their calculation for the warranty and need to verify whether it is done correctly. Another concern that you would have is the fact that in the third paragraph, it says customers who wish to purchase a property are required to pay a 5% non-refundable deposit prior to completion of the building. So again, people that want to purchase a property gives the company a 5% non-refundable deposit. Why is that a risk? Because how they're gonna record it. Can they take that into revenue or do they have to set it up as deferred revenue? The latter, deferred revenue. So again, if they get money up front that they haven't yet earned, the risk is they're going to record it as revenue rather than deferred revenue because what they should do is record it as deferred revenue. Then when the project is complete, they can recognize the full amount. Discuss with management the treatment of deposits to ensure it's done correctly. Make sure that they're not taking these deposits and recording them as revenue when they should be unearned revenue. There is a risk. It goes on to say that the, at the end of that paragraph, that set, that's the end of that paragraph, customers who wish to purchase a property, it says the finance director has informed you that although an allowance for receivables has historically been maintained, it's, an, it's anticipated that this year it could be significantly reduced. Right off the bat, the allowance of Delphi accounts is subjective. They want to reduce it significantly. That means it's material. You need to verify whether or not it should be reduced significantly. It's a risk. They may be wanting to reduce it in order to increase their receivables. Because why? Because they have a covenant that, that they have to meet. That's why maybe they were trying to reduce their allowance in order to have a higher receivable to meet a covenant. The bottom line is you need to discuss with management the rationale for reducing the receivables, which means for reducing the provision for the receivables, the allowance, you need to do an extensive test to make sure that any reduction in the allowance with alpha accounts is justifiable. The second last paragraph tells you that the fact is that they must maintain, it says that the prior year financial statements in August 2017 
management accounts contain a material overdraft. The finance directors confirm there's a minimal profit and net assets covenants attached to the overdraft. So this is a risk because if they violate that covenant, they have to pay back the loan as a result. And meanwhile, they're in an overdraft position. So that's not good. If they're in an overdraft position, that increases the risk that they could be violating the covenant. And as a result, maybe they have to pay back the loan. Maybe they don't have the funds. They're in an overdraft position. This is clearly a going concern issue. We need to review the covenant calculations prepared by the company. We need to ultimately determine whether or not they have violated the covenant. Finally, a review of the management account showed that payable period was 56 days for August 2007 compared to 87 days for September 2016. Okay, so the payable days is going down. The finance director anticipates that September 2017 payable days will be even lower than those in August. So again, this is a risk because if the analytic review, which we just talked about, indicates that the payable days have gone from 56 for August 2017 compared to 87, so again, it's going down, yet the forecasted profit is higher. Did you notice in the first paragraph, they tell you that they expect a higher profit for this year compared to the prior year? That's the first paragraph, so think about it. If the profit is to be higher, you'd expect your payables to be higher. Also, the company's cash position has yet continued to deteriorate, and therefore it's unusual for payable days to have decreased. Okay, so if they expect a higher forecast, we would expect there'd be more payables, right? If they're, if they're doing better, they have more volume, more transactions, you'd expect things to get better. When it comes to payables, it's actually getting worse. We're now worried that the payables could be understated. So once again, you need to respond to that risk. You should do additional testing at year end to ensure that the payables are not understated. You're worried about completeness. Maybe you need to do is send out payables, circularizations to a number of suppliers to confirm how much they owe because you're concerned that potentially they could be understating their payables. Take the balances that are very low, confirm them to, with, them, with the suppliers, to see if they're understating their payables because it doesn't make sense. If there's more action going on, you expect the payables to be going up, not down. Why are they going down? Are they going down because there's an error? Or are they going down because there's a good reason? You need to verify that. Okay, so I gave you 10 risks that you could mention, even though they're only looking for seven. The key is to explain, explain the risk, how it impacts the financial statements, and make sure you indicate a good response to those risks. Okay, so this is a very good question because you're going to get another question on your AA paper. It's not gonna be the same, but after a while, for those of you that are practicing these types of questions, similar things keep coming up, up, and, uh, up and again. These times that inventory keeps increasing, you're worried about obsolescence when it comes to inventory. Any time of anytime there's any estimates, that's clearly a risk. Okay, so that's why I'm encouraging you to look at that paper I gave you that indicated the topics and previous questions in that topic. That's what you need to do. You need to pick a day of the week and saying, I'm gonna do audit risk questions one after the other. When I'm tired of doing them and I know I'm doing them well, you can stop doing it. Now's the time to practice, to be prepared, not to practice it, not to practice when the real thing occurs. Because if you're not prepared, you're gonna to get to practice again the next time the paper is offered. Okay, so I'm not, I'm just encouraging you to um, be prepared. Any questions? Okay, so there's no questions. Then what we need to do is to continue with chapter four which again is another area that we know that they're gonna ask. Okay. Okay, so again, what you have to be aware of is the fact that there are six systems. There's purchases, payable, and expenses. There's sales and receivables. There's payroll, there's inventory, there's cash, and there's non-current assets. As an auditor, we know that we have to understand the internal controls. It's a requirement. Why do we look at the internal controls? For two reasons. One, 
to decide if we want to rely on those controls. And if we do, we're going to pick a sample of transactions and test those controls. We have to decide our approach. Remember, there's two approaches to an audit, a combined approach where you look at the controls and they're wonderful and you test them and they work. Then your control risk is low, detection risk is high. You don't have to get as much evidence at your end. But the other reason you have to look at the controls is that you have a responsibility under the standards to inform management about all control weaknesses, implication, and recommendations. You have to issue a management letter. This is why they're going to test you, guaranteed, on internal controls, because it's a requirement that you need to do. Just make sure that when you identify the control, you explain why it's a control weakness. What can go wrong? How could it impact the company's operations? Make sure when you have a re recommendation, it addresses your control weakness. It doesn't come out of left field. So who's responsible for making sure there's good internal controls? Management. Why do you want good internal controls? To prevent errors and fraud, that five letter word. Manager responsible for making sure there's good internal controls. We as an auditor, our responsibility is to look at the controls to once again, make a decision as to whether or not we want to rely on them because that's going to determine ultimately our audit approach. Internal controls do the following. It prevents and detects errors and fraud. It helps safeguard the assets and it helps the company run efficiently and hopefully effectiveness and effectively as well. Again, our responsibilities is to understand the controls, make an assessment as to whether or not we want to rely on them. Typically when the controls are good, we will rely on them because we believe it's more efficient to not test those controls, so it's more efficient to test those controls and do less substantive procedures. But if you decide that it's more efficient to not test the controls and to instead focus on certain transactions at year end, which will give you a large portion of the balance, then that's the approach you're gonna take. But sometimes you look at the controls, you think they're good, you test them, they're not effective, you assess the control risk at high, which means you can't rely on the controls. What do we mean by internal controls? It comprises of the following areas. A strong control environment, strong control procedures, good risk assessment, good information systems, good and effective monitoring of controls. The control environment is the management's attitudes. Do they have an internal audit department? Do they have a code of ethics? A company that has a code of ethics that requires individuals in the company to sign every year, their control environment must, is much stronger than a company that doesn't have a code of ethics. A company that has an internal audit department versus one that does it, the first one has a stronger control environment because if you work in a company that has an internal audit department, then you're gonna be more likely to be careful as to what you do because you know that one day you may be audited and you'll never know what could happen as a result of that audit. Surrogation of duties. Those companies that have good surrogation of duties with different people in the organization do different things. Once again, it has a better control environment.